The thing that I've learned, and I've worked with some phenomenal lawyers over the years, um, some of the you know titans, if you will, of the industry, and you know I'm not going to name any names, but there's a few that I've worked with who have been doing medical malpractice for years, and it is true that you do begin to learn a lot of the medicine. However, it's still not the same. Like I've I've been in rooms where a very very good, very successful medical malpractice lawyer just got it wrong. And, and the problem was you don't know what you don't know, and that's what makes you dangerous. Welcome to the Tip the Scales podcast, where we discuss running and growing your law firm. I'm your host, Maria Monroy, president and co-founder of Law Inc. Today, I am joined by Peter McCool. I'm super excited about this episode. Peter is an ER doctor, also a lawyer. I can't imagine going through medical school and then law school. Like, that's just a lot. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Peter McCool. I have a funny story. We can start here and then you can tell us all, all about you. Okay, let's do it. A couple years ago, we received a contact submission on the website and it was Peter McCool and then it had a Gmail address or something like that. And we thought it was spam. <laughs> <laughs> And then Bob Simon introduced us and I'm like, are you fucking with me? And he's like, no, I'm like, that's really his name. And I called you and I was like, you have the coolest name, but I thought you weren't real. Nope. In the flesh. I'm real. So, But there's actually a funnier story about that, if you want. Um, so when we got married, my wife brought her papers home. First of all, I, I married way out of my league. So, you know. Good to know. Yes. It, oh my God. I could never be single again. That'd be terrible. But so um, she brings the papers home and says, you know, okay, I'm going to go change my name. And I was just joking around and said, hey, let's just both change our names. And I kind of was shocked when she said, okay. And I, I hadn't given it any thought. Like I just was joking kind of. And so that's, we actually just made up the name McCool. Oh, you made it up? Yeah, like literally. That, oh, that makes me feel way better. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, let's start here. So you are every parent's dream on crack <laughs> because you were an ER doctor for how long? 18 years? I mean, I still am. So You still are to this day? Yeah, I just worked a 48-hour shift like just a couple of days ago. That's so, crazy. Yeah. Um, I mean, my goal is to eventually not do that. But you're also a lawyer. Right. Yes. How long ago did you go to law school? I enrolled, it was 2016, and I did the part-time program at Loyola in Chicago. And it was a new design at the time. It was every other weekend on campus. So okay. I still worked like 80, 90 hours a week in the ER and then did law school kind of on the side and um, graduated 2020, of course, right into the pandemic, which was amazing. And all the job offers I had were sort of you know, let's give it a few years because, you know, nobody yeah. knew it was going to happen. And then you were so needed at that time in the hospital. Yeah, I was working quite a bit. And, you know, especially at that time, we really didn't know what was going to happen with COVID. I mean, it was the world ending. I mean, nobody really knew. How do you have the energy, though? Like, that's an absurd amount of, of... <laughs> I, I think it's probably a combination of semi-controlled ADHD, caffeine, and just um, just a curiosity that is sort of always there. Wanting to learn more, I guess. So what's next? Are you going to become a scientist or something? Well, no. uh, actually, kind of. No, you're kidding me. Okay, so <laughs> sort of. So um, there is uh, a program that I'm enrolling in at MIT. It's in the Applied Data Sciences program. I was joking, dude. I know, I but I had to jump on it because this is, this is, I'm so geeked out about this new venture uh, to add to the toolbox of being a lawyer doctor. Uh, and it's... Um, using artificial intelligence and coding uh, and programming uh, to use this thing called predictive analytics. Um, and I'm super excited about it. You can basically, there's a few, you probably actually know a lot of these lawyers like Sean Claggett. Yeah, you know, I love Sean. Uh, right. So he uh, works with, um, there's a, a couple who uh, does this, um, John and Alicia. Um, they, they actually live in Spain. Oh, wait, are you talking about John Campbell? Campbell. He's, yeah. he's been on the podcast yeah. before. So, so, so actually, sh I think Sean introduced me to John, and that's how yeah. he ended up on the podcast. They, they do a lot of these cases the, together. Yeah, big data. And so I, when I heard a podcast with those two, it, I was, it wasn't my podcast. Uh, no, it was not. No, I'm I offended. To, I, I am. Well, I'm I will kidding, go I'm back kidding. and do it. So I heard what they were doing, and just, you know, as a physician, 
you know, I sort of have that scientific mind always in the background. And I thought, this is like it, you know? And so I found this program and I've actually spoken with John and, you know, I'm hoping to work with him and Alicia on, you know, cases when I'm finished. So uh, my goal is to incorporate that big data analysis practice into my practice too, sort of a, a mini data scientist, if you will. That's awesome. So that's very cool. So now you work uh, how many hours a week at the hospital? 40 to 60, probably. And then when do you lawyer and how much do you lawyer? You know, I kind of lawyer sort of all the time in the background. So, you know, with medical malpractice cases, which are a majority of what I focus on, or nursing home cases, um, you know, the discovery and the sort of pre-litigation phase is long. And, you know, a lot of it you can do these days from wherever. And so I'll often, and I, I specifically chose to work in smaller town ERs so that I can, you know, and my downtime work my lawyer job. Now, I guess the question that I have for you is, what is the benefit of someone consulting with you or bringing you on to co-counsel a case versus a lawyer that, say, has 30 years of medical malpractice experience and that's all they do and they're very good at it? Like, what is that extra kind of benefit of having an actual doctor on a case. The thing that I've learned, and I've worked with some phenomenal lawyers over the years, um, some of the you know titans, if you will, of the industry, and you know, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a few that I've worked with who have been doing medical malpractice for years. And it is true that you do begin to learn a lot of the medicine. However, it's still not the same. Like I've I've been in rooms where a very, very good, very successful medical malpractice lawyer just got it wrong. And and the problem was you don't know what you don't know. And that's what makes you dangerous. So what don't they know? Just the nuances of the medicine, really. Can you give me an example? There was a case where it was a young child. Um, and and I, I don't want to give you know, locations. Of There's course. sensitive info there. But as a young child, he unfortunately was misdiagnosed. He had this thing called ITP. And it's where... You, your body basically gobbles up platelets, you know, and this lawyer was insistent that, you know, nothing could have been done. He was absolutely just insistent. Whereas, you know, I knew, yes, something could have been done. Absolutely. He, you know, had experience with similar cases and just did not want to let that go. And and this is like a known quantity in the space. Very much so. I was not in a position as, I guess, a consultant, if you will, to sway that opinion. And so... Wow. But then why consult with you if they're not going to listen to what you have to say? You know, I... Well, that's a great question, one that I would ask them, uh, but... All right, give me their name. No, just but yeah, I did. Well, at the end of the day, though, you know, I think that that's the exception rather than the rule. Most of the folks that I do work with, even you know, right now, I'm working a number of cases with a lawyer who has spent the last 20 years doing medical malpractice work. And, you know, he takes the approach of okay, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna work on this case. I, I go through all the medical issues with him, but then I can also, he'll also pick my brain as far as the, the litigator piece of it, the lawyer piece of it. To be able to meld those two together uh, is, is not necessarily easy if you don't do both of them on a regular basis. If you could give lawyers that specialize in medical malpractice any advice besides consult with me, what would it be? Always ask yourself, what am I missing? And keep looking to the, the literature, keep you know, your, your options open because it's very easy to get tunnel vision, uh, especially when you're invested heavily in a case. You, know, you want a particular outcome, you're sort of naturally biased toward that. And it, it could be very easy to lose sight of the big picture. And so, especially in the early stages of working up a case and explaining it, um, I think that as a lawyer and only a lawyer, even if you're the best at doing this particular type of work, be humble and, and ask yourself, is there a better way to tell a story? Because at the end of the day, it's the story that'll matter. You'll, you'll be able to you know get the evidence. You'll have the experts help you with that. Maybe if, you know, you're unclear on an issue, you'll rely heavily on a couple of experts. But at the end of the day, you know, us doctors, the, the good ones anyways, and I'm not sure if everyone would maybe necessarily put me in that basket, but uh, I, you know, enjoy the storytelling of medicine, you know, so I can 
come off of a phone call with an expert, you know, that I'm, well, not an expert, a uh, specialist, let's say, let's say it about a stroke. And we're talking through, okay, you know, yeah, I think this patient actually does need to come down by you for, you know, a procedure where they can open up this blocked artery uh, and use special medications that, you know, aren't available everywhere. Um, but at any rate, you know, I can go from that very complex conversation to the bedside and talk to the family and convince them to see it from my side, uh, my point of view, you know, and I have to get these people to make decisions in like minutes because the clock is ticking and either, you know, they're losing brain cells that are not going to be able to be saved with every second that ticks and there's a blockage or similar for a heart attack. I can take a very complex issue, convince the family that this is what's going on. Here's why, here's how we know it. I know this is scary, but you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And if you can break it down in a way that they're comfortable with, they understand that and they'll see it from your point of view. And similarly with a jury, if you can break it down to the level where your everyday average Joe just, he, they get it, you know, uh, they're going to side with you a lot of the time. And you know how to sort of tell the story in a way that allows the jurors to, to answer those questions themselves. Then they validate, oh yeah. That's what I was thinking. And and I was right, you know? And so you can, I, I guess, load yourself up, uh, if you will, for success by being able to translate the complex medicine into a narrative, a story uh, that is told and understood by the jurors better than, let's say, somebody who might be a great medical malpractice attorney, but they, they don't have that experience. They've never spoken to a family in crunch time, you know, while everything is on the line. That person could die right in front of you if you don't get this right. Have you been able to try med mal cases already or not yet? The problem, yeah, the problem is I have worked on them. It's just most of them settle. And since I became licensed in 2021, I just haven't had one that has gone to trial. So a couple have settled. I've taken in new cases, new work. I've worked on, you know, existing cases with other counsel as sort of off counsel or, you know, as a consultant. But, you know, I just, since I graduated, I haven't had a case go to trial yet. I guess that's not well, a terrible we'll, thing. We'll have to have you come back when, when oh, you man. do. Oh, man, I'll be ready. I'll okay, be ready. I yep. can't wait. So now, how does it work? If somebody wants to consult with you, what are the services that you offer? Do you consult for someone that's like, hey, I think I have a case, but I'm not sure? Or do you only consult on like, let me look at, at this and see what I can tell? Like once there already is a case, how does it work? Actually, I'm pretty flexible when it comes to that. And I think you have to be just to, you know, I, I guess the way I see it is I want to help all of my fellow plaintiff's attorneys get sort of that I don't want to call it an edge because the deck is already stacked against us in terms of the defense and the resources they have, you know, in comparison to us plaintiffs lawyers who do this work. So I will do whatever it takes to help my fellow attorneys across the country litigate these cases. And so, for example, right now, um, I have several cases where it's just a very simple question and, you know, kind of in and out. But I always sort of leave myself in the case as a consultant, you know, and, and they'll come back to me periodically, ask a question or two here or there. And, you know, it, it just, whatever their needs might be. And do um, you bill them hourly? Yeah, at least, but that's also the client's um, sort of preference. Now, I have had uh, also cases where I've just charged a flat sort of fee, you know, and it's sort of the whole shebang, whatever you need through the life of the case, I'll help you out with, you know, and even offer to, I'll give you my consulting fees back if you want me to come in on the case as, you know, off counsel and just try it with you. Have you so, been able to do that yet or no? Not yet. Been a bit more than a year. So um, several cases have come in and they're still all, these are very slow moving pieces, but they'll get there. I can't imagine going through medical school and then law school. Like that's just a lot. Um, that's really cool. I don't have it in me, but I guess I'm curious, like, how are you networking? Like, how are you getting, putting yourself out there? Because it must also not be the easiest, right? Like you were probably older when you went to, I mean, you were. Yeah. It's just a fact. Much. Oh, 100%. Yes. I <laughs> when, was not quite the grandfather in the class, but I was, I was definitely up there. Yeah. So sure. the, the like bonding with your classmates is not going to be the same because there's such an age gap. My husband went to law school when he was in his 
late 30s. So I've kind of seen that aspect of it. And and then it's like you get out in the real world, right? Like you're done with law school. You don't have any experience, but you are older. But then you have this whole other world that you're a part of. So how have you been able to kind of put yourself out there? And and I would say that's where the time availability piece has been a bit of a challenge because I'm still working ER hours and working lawyer hours. And I have a wife and four amazing kids. And so trying to balance all of that in the network. Um, now that we've moved back to Chicago, you know, home, if you will, um, it's been a bit easier to go to, I'm, I'm much more of a relationship sort of talkative kind of person. And so, you know, I'll try to go to events and network and that's why I'm here, you know? And, yeah. and so just to meet up with like-minded folks. And, you know, I think that it is all about relationships. And I think the way that you and I came about were, you know, I literally emailed Bob Simon after listening to a, a lecture he had done and he responded to me right away. I mean, I was like, whoa, gosh, he's the okay. best. He, he's, he's the best networker, it, period. It, in our yeah. Space. I think that's very hard to refute. He's pretty darn good. And I was just like, shocked that he got back to me so quickly. And then he had, you know, sent me your way and, and one thing led to another. But, you know, it, so it is just about um, those relationships and, you know, making those connections because who knows? I mean, that could be where your next big case comes from. You just yeah. don't know. So is this your first conference in it a is. while, right? Yeah. Or first it, period. First period as a lawyer, just because it's just every time I've tried and I actually registered for this last year. Then, I remember. Yeah, I got stuck working. So or something. I don't know if we're moving maybe or something other, happened. But, yeah. So it didn't work. Um, but I, this time around, I said, I need to. This is slated. I got to make this happen. You know, I got to get out of town and do this. And um, it just worked out that I was able to arrange the rest of the schedule and didn't have anything pressing. Um, you know, and. No, what has it been like coming here to a conference where you probably don't know very many people? Do you find it that people are welcoming? What's oh. it like? Because I think a lot of lawyers are afraid to network and put them, themselves out there. Yeah. I, no, I, I I am an extrovert, I think. So it's not too terrible. I mean, I could be in a room full of strangers and still talk to folks without really much difficulty. But um, I, I do think it, it's... It can be daunting. You know, you walk in. I, I mean, I just got here a few hours ago. So you walk in and it's just packed with people. And, you know, most of them are, are lawyers from, you know, all over the place. I mean, I think it's really neat. Uh, interestingly, I had gone to a litigation group meeting and it is kind of funny how I sat next to another doctor lawyer who's also an ER doctor but lawyer. there aren't that many. Who no, was it? Uh, Christian... Um, Oh, I have his card in my pocket, but um, he's uh, in California. Uh, so. There, how many of you are there? There's, uh, there's just a handful, right? There, there's not. Yeah, there's especially those that do plaintiffs' med mal work. That that's a much smaller number. Um, I, I heard a statistic. I mean, it was maybe couple thousand doctor lawyers across the country but like of that just a very small percentage do this kind of work you guys need like a mastermind <laughs> probably yeah. i think you're right i mean i'm open to suggestions <laughs> <laughs> now tell us about your new endeavor you just partnered up with a firm right yes uh so there is a na national firm law md um archie rich is the founder he's out of dc and he actually he and i connected back um before I moved out to DC, um, but it just it it wouldn't have worked out or made sense in my role at the time. You know, I, I needed to get in with a firm and learn how to you know litigate these cases because they're big and complex. And so I needed to from intake to settlement trial. I needed to go through that. And so the, sorry. So the past ever since you got your bar card, which was when twenty one twenty one, yeah. You've been, you practiced, at, you worked at a law firm? Yeah. I in, was DC, in DC, right? Yeah. Just for context, what were you doing there? Med mal cases? Med mal cases. Okay, cool. And then you went off on your own? Yep. Recently? Yeah. And now you've partnered up with? Law MD. And what it does, you know, I, I think the concept is outstanding. It brings together um, a bunch of doctor lawyers who do plaintiff's medical malpractice. And the goal there is to have 
physicians in as many specialties as we can or subspecialties that are also trial lawyers who want to try these cases. And most of them who have been trying these cases for sometimes, in some cases, decades. And so I think I'm by far one of the younger, uh, or I don't know my quotes. Yeah, I'm on camera. So the quotes were there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> younger uh, lawyers, at least in, in the the group. Um, and In they, age or in experience both oh wow yeah okay. i mean I, i'm not sure i i do know well yeah i guess like just the fact that somebody has to put themselves through medical school and then go be a doctor like it's never going to be like a 24 year old kid or but, yeah no you know. that's uh or if they were they'd be incredibly like genius but yeah i um, guess it could know, happen i mean so <laughs> but no so it's um there he Archie had asked if I would open the Chicago office um, of Law MD, and this was just sort of a recent development that we had been working on for a, a little bit, but you know weren't sure how we could make that work. And uh, he just went through a very big marketing uh, campaign that's going to launch in the Chicago market. I'm soon. bummed that I wasn't part of that. Well, I if <laughs> it kidding. was mine, I'm teasing. You I'm teasing. Be. I'm just teasing. You know. Oh, I know, but. I honestly, I'm a loyal fan, you and are? so I would, I would bring you in in the fold. Thank you, yeah. I appreciate that. Of course. So, what are you most excited about right now? Life in general, I guess. I think, you know, there was a time when I was in law school, uh, towards the end, especially, uh, where, you know, because it's COVID and you're just getting so burned out of medicine, and you're thinking like, I'm so close to the finish line. I just need to pass the bar exam, and you know then get out there and start doing this. And, you know, but then then you pass the bar and you realize, well, now I got to get experience, you know, and it's like, okay, but that's fine. I'll do that. And then, you know, you do that and you decide, hey, I'm going to start my own firm. This is a great idea. And I'm going to do a super niche firm. All right. How are you going to pay the bills while you wait for those cases? Like you might get a $20 million birth injury case um, that's buttoned up, you know, absolutely as right. good of a chance you can get, but you might not get paid on that case for like 10 years. So, yeah. I mean, how do you, I mean, I have a family. So, um, does your wife work? She, she, yeah, well, yes, her hardest, the hardest job I think in the world, she's, she's at home with the kids. That's the best kids. answer so, ever. Uh, but I'm telling you, like, wow, that well, <laughs> is the best answer ever. But it's the truth. She, you know, I have to give her credit. I mean, she, um, I couldn't do that. Like what I she, mean is you guys are, you're a single uh, salary yeah. home. Yeah. But, but, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, like if, you know, she, let's say got really sick or something happened, like, I, I don't know how it would make this work. I really, I don't know. You know, um, it's just such a symbiotic relationship that we have, you know, because while I'm gone and I, I travel for work, so my ER uh, job is way up north in Wisconsin, about five hours away from where I live in Chicago. Um, and it, it's purposely that way. I think way. you're built differently. Probably. I really do. I thought I thought I worked a lot and traveled a lot. I feel like you work a lot more than I do. Just, you know, seeing all the places you go and the travels you do. I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I'm not Pretty so fun. sure. Again, I, you know, she was the one who let me go through law school. Um, I say let me, you know, because we had a kid halfway through and then another one right at the end. And, you know, that all those things when I'm working and gone and studying. I mean, she never complained. She just, you know, does it. She's like built. But do you feel guilty about not being around as much for the kids? A lot. Yeah. I mean, and you go through these sort of waves where, you know, you feel real guilty and, you know. But I do make every effort to try and keep that the center of life no matter what. So, for example, if I you know, work a 48-hour shift, I might have 24 hours off and I work another 48, let's say, you know, which I do fairly often just to stack, you know, the shifts together. Well, you know, it's a five-hour drive home, but I'll drive five hours. Do you, you sleep first though, right? No, I just go, you know, but it's – but I've learned over the years that – I don't drive if I'm tired. So if I'm tired, oh, okay. I'll, I'll pull over because I have no shame in that. Like it's, you know, I don't need to push through that much. But, you know, I'll drive five hours, get home around one in the afternoon, pick the kids up from school, you know, with my wife, go to whatever, like a basketball game or something, just be able to like put them to bed and then turn around and drive back up to work, you know, another five hours. But it's 
you know, and my wife thinks I'm nuts for that. But it's, I think you're nuts for that. It, Everybody <laughs> listening right now thinks you. I, I, again, you're built differently. I mean, that's awesome that you have that in you. But, but it's, you know, but that's part of the guilt, I think, too, is like, I don't want to have the kids feel like, you know, uh, dad is never around and, you know, his job was more important than us or, you know, things like that. So, so I just want them to know, like, I'll do everything I can to be there and, and, you know, try to do whatever I can to make it work. And also, I know that eventually, like, once I'm cutting down the ER hours, which will, you know, happen over the next couple of years, then I'll be at least nearby home. I won't have to drive five hours Why away. Why a couple of years? You never know. No, no, you, you right. Could, you it, could get it could be, an amazing settlement. Yeah, it could be like a week or two from now. You know, who yeah. knows? So I, I just I'm mean, gonna. I think you should manifest that. I think I will. Yes, I, I think I'll let will you know too. how that goes too. I think it's going to be good. The positive vibes. Yeah, yeah, I okay. like it. All yeah. right. Well, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, my email uh, is p mccool at justicerxlaw dot com, um, or I have an office number. No, I think we're good with the email. Yeah, we'll that's put it. The best. We'll put it in the in the show notes. Yeah. And if you check out his website, Lauren did it. Yes, they did. And they did a, I must, can I just plug here? Law Rank is absolutely fantastic. Every step of the way, they've been amazing, especially to a, a non techie, at least yet, person uh, who does not know anything about that, never did anything with websites or anything. Um, they really were very patient with me in setting up this amazing website. So, yes, I would encourage you to check out the website as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Thank you so much, Peter, for everything he shared with us today. If you found this story valuable, please share it with someone you want to see succeed. Subscribe so you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review. It goes a long way to help others discover the show.